Chapter Two: My Present Environment, Work, and Activities. Well, my environment differs in rather important respects from that of my readers. I can assure you, with ironic understatement, that it is as vivid, varied, and vital as physical existence. It is more pleasurable, though my ideas of pleasure have changed some since I was a physical being, being more rewarding and offering far greater opportunities for creative achievement. My present existence is the most challenging one that I have known, and I have known many, both physical and non-physical. There is not just the one dimension in which non-physical consciousness resides, any more than there is only one country on your planet or planet within your solar system. My environment now. Is not the one in which you will find yourself immediately after death. I cannot help speaking humorously, but you must die many times before you enter this particular plane of existence. Birth is much more of a shock than death. Sometimes when you die, you do not realize it, but birth almost always implies a sharp and sudden recognition. So there is no need to fear death, and I, who have died more times than I care to tell, write this book to tell you so. My work in this environment provides far more challenge than any of you know, and it also necessitates the manipulation of creative materials that are nearly beyond your present comprehension. I will say more of this shortly. First of all, you must understand that no objective reality exists but that which is created by consciousness. Consciousness always creates form and not the other way around. So my environment is a reality of existence created by myself and others like me. And it represents the manifestation of our development. We do not use permanent structures. There is not a city or a town, for example, in which I dwell. I do not mean to imply that we are off in empty space. For one thing, we do not think of space as you do, and we form whatever particular images we want to surround us. They are created by our mental patterns, just as your own physical reality is created in perfect replica of your inner desires and thoughts. You think that objects exist independently of you, not realizing that they are instead the manifestations of your own psychological and psychic selves. We realize that we form our own reality. And therefore, we do so with considerable joy and creative abandon. In my environment, you would be highly disoriented, for it would seem to you as if it lacked a coherency. We are aware of the inner laws that govern all materializations. However, I can have it night or day in your terms as I prefer. Or any period, say, of your history, these changing forms would in no way bother my associates, for they would take them as immediate clues as to my mood, feelings, and ideas. Permanency and stability basically have nothing to do with form, but with the integration of pleasure, purpose, accomplishment, and identity. I travel to many other levels of existence in order to fulfill my duties, which are primarily those of a teacher and educator, and I use whatever aids and techniques serve me best within those systems. In other words, I may teach the same lesson in many different ways, according to the abilities and assumptions that are inherent in any given system. In which I must operate, 
I use one portion of myself from many personalities that are available to my identity in these communications and in this book. In other systems of reality, this particular self personality that I, the larger self identity adopted here, would not be understood. All systems of reality are not physically oriented, you see, and some are entirely unacquainted with physical form. Nor is sex, as you understand it, natural to them. Therefore, I would not communicate as a male personality who has lived many physical existences, though this is a legitimate and valid portion of my identity. In my home environment, I assume whatever shape I please, and it may vary and does with the nature of my thoughts. You, however, form your own physical image at an unconscious level in more or less the same manner, but with some important differences. You usually do not realize that your physical body is created by you at each moment as a direct result of your inner conception of what you are or that it changes in important chemical and electromagnetic ways with the ever-moving pace of your own thought. Having long ago recognized the dependence of form upon consciousness, we have simply been able to change our forms entirely so that they more faithfully follow each nuance of our inner experience. This ability to change form is an inherent characteristic of any consciousness. Only the degree of proficiency and actualization varies. You can see this in your own system, in a slow down version, when you observe the changing forms taken by living matter through its evolutionary history. Now, we can also take several forms at one time, so to speak, but you can also do this although you do not generally realize it. Your physical form can lie sleeping and inert upon the bed, while your consciousness travels in a dream form to places quite distant. Simultaneously, you may create a thought form of yourself identical in every respect and this may appear in the room of a friend quite without your conscious awareness. So consciousness is not limited as to the forms it can create at any given time. Practically speaking, we are rather more advanced along these lines than you, and when we create such forms, we do so with complete awareness. I share my field of existence with others who have more or less the same challenges to meet, the same overall pattern of development. Some I have known and others I have not. We communicate telepathically, but then again, telepathy is the basis for your languages, without which their symbolism would be meaningless. Because we do communicate in this manner, this does not necessarily mean that we use mental words, for we do not. We communicate instead through what I can only call thermal and uh, electromagnetic images that are capable of supporting much more meaning in one sequence. The intensity of the communication is dependent upon the emotional intensity behind it although the phrase emotional intensity may be misleading. We do feel an equivalent of what you call emotions, though these are not the love or hate or anger that you know. Your feelings can best be described as the three-dimensional materializations of far greater psychological events and experiences that are related to the inner senses. I will explain these inner senses to you later at the end of this chapter. Suffice it here to say that we have strong emotional experience, although it differs in a large measure from your own. 
it is far less limited and far more expensive in that we are also aware and responsive to the emotional climate as a whole. We are much freer to feel and experience because we are not so afraid of being swept away by feeling. Our identities do not feel threatened, for example, by the strong emotions of another. We are able to travel through emotions in a way that is not now natural to you and to translate them into other facets of creativity than those with which you are familiar. We do not feel the need to conceal emotions, for we know it is basically impossible and undesirable. Within your system, they can appear troublesome because you have not yet learned how to use them. We are only now learning their full potential and the powers of creativity with which they are connected.